two themes stand out to me in this week's text from the Gospel of John, and they are themes that surround us day in and day out lately. Worry and change. Again and again, we worry about everything. And again and again, we are confronted with change. And our Lenten refrain this week reminds us that again and again, we are reformed. As we journey closer and closer to the cross, to Holy Week, to Easter, our gospel this morning lands us at the beginning of the Passover. Jesus goes to Jerusalem to worship at the Passover festival. And among all who came to worship were some Greeks. We are reminded of the good news in John chapter 3 last week that God sent Jesus for all to be saved, not just the Jews. And so here in John 12, we see evidence of Jesus' message expanding the reach beyond the Jews. This group of Greeks go to Philip and express that they wish to see Jesus. Philip then goes and tells Andrew, and together, Philip and Andrew go and tell Jesus that they want to see him. Jesus responds by saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The presence of the Greeks here speaks to the inclusive nature of Jesus' gospel. Word has gotten out about Jesus' ministry, and people have gotten to be a little curious. It's in this moment that Jesus announces that the hour has come. It is now time for the Son of Man to be glorified. This, then, is the start of the end. Jesus has entered into Jerusalem, a triumphal entry in which we will celebrate and dig deeper into next week on Palm Sunday. Here he interprets his death. Then he will give his farewell discourse at the Last Supper, which then leads to his betrayal, arrest, trial, and crucifixion. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This is the message for Jews and Greeks alike. The Son of Man has come not only for the Jews, but also for the Greeks. After Jesus makes this announcement that the hour has come, he continues saying, Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. One of the commentators for this again and again series is Reverend T. Denise Anderson, the coordinator for racial and intercultural justice with the Presbyterian Mission Agency and the former co-moderator of the 222nd General Assembly of the PCUSA. She writes that here in this discourse, Jesus telegraphs the vision. In order to, for the seed to bear fruit, it must die. Those who follow Jesus must go where he goes. Whoever tries to retain their life will ultimately lose it. She goes on to briefly tell of a time when she was called to pastor a church through dissolution. She and the congregation realized that change would happen either with us or to us. We could die to some things so that we could live to others, or we could hold on to what is and die with it. Only one of these is a faithful way forward. Change happens with us or to us. We can choose with God's help to adapt and embrace the change because again and again we are reformed and God is reforming us. Change is happening now whether we like it or not. Change is happening to our society whether we like it or not. This pandemic is forcing us to change. It's forcing us to think about where we have been 
and how we have lived. It's forcing us to think about what worked and what didn't work. It's our opportunity now to think about how we need to change what wasn't working. We can let the change that the pandemic is bringing happen to us without thinking about it or adapting to it, trying to stay the same, or we can move with the change. We've already adapted to our lifestyles and how our lifestyles need to be because of the pandemic, though we certainly haven't liked it. We need now to be thinking about how we need to adapt as we move out of this pandemic, as we move with the hope that is beginning to emerge as more and more of us are being vaccinated. We need to think about what is happening around us and go with the change. Asking Jesus, as we journey with you to the cross, how do we die to the old and rise with you into the new. All of this talk of change can bring about some worry. Change is not easy. It can be disconcerting. But Jesus has something to say to us about that too. Right after he talks of change, he reflects, now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus knows what this next few days will bring. He knows what will happen to him, and here he sits with Andrew and Philip with a troubled soul. But right after he expresses this worry, he questions aloud, should I say, Father, save me from this hour? He immediately answers, no, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. He expresses worry, questions what he should do about it, and then rests in his assurance that he is doing exactly what he came here to do. In that moment of worry, Jesus turns to God for comfort. The three little owls in the story Owl Babies do a lot of worrying. They wake to find their mother is not in the nest, and they know not where she has gone, or why, or when she will return. They're not quite sure what to do with themselves. So they do what owls do best. They sat and they thought, because all owls think a lot. Sounds like a lot of Presbyterians. We do that well. We sit and we think. And some of us overthink. And when confronted with a new era, with a new problem, a new issue to solve, with a social injustice, with something that needs to be changed, we study the heck out of it. And we worry too. We worry about the change. We worry about lamenting what we will have lost, even as we fill with excitement and hope of what is to come. Friends, I am here to tell you that we may never again experience worship in our sanctuaries in the same way we did before the pandemic even if only because we have changed. We are forever having been changed from having gone through this experience, being forced to adapt, to change, to recreate, to reform our worship and bring our worship and our community time with one another online has opened us to new opportunities new ways of being community in broader ways than ever before, even as we lament that we have not been in person in our sanctuaries, worshiping together. In the coming months ahead, it's time to sit and think. It's time to assess what was working and what wasn't. 
It's time to celebrate what's working now and celebrate that we've gotten this far. And I know for us over at Covenant, it's time to start thinking practically and theologically about how to bring a kind of hybrid style of worship into our church building again so that we can be present in person with one another and in our worship, and yet also present online with our kindred who have stayed so connected with us online throughout this pandemic. Some churches are already thinking about how to get a Zoom screen into their sanctuary and consider having people in the pews on Zoom as well, so Zoomers at home can see the faces of worshipers in the pews. The creativity and possibilities are endless. It's going to be strange, for sure. It's going to take time and energy and adjusting, but we will be stronger and a more faithful community for it. And so as we sit and think, because all Presbyterians think a lot, may God calm our worry and turn it into certainty as we continue to journey through the wilderness that is Lent and pandemic life, discerning how God is calling us to change, how God is changing us already individually and communally. Again and again, may we be reformed. Amen.